Welcome to the Most High Show, a show about recovery, spirituality, and the 12 steps. Produced, hosted, and posted by people in recovery who've been given strength and hope and want to share it with you. If you or someone you love is suffering, we want you to know you are not alone. This is the Most High Show. Oh, uh, yeah. How's the mic sound? Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> yeah. Fantabulous. Fantastic. Fabulous. Way better than the average. With way more than you'll ever have. You could call me the better half. Better nap. Better nap. Because I'm old as crap. Hard dog crap in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> talking about take a boo boo, a doo doo. With the most high show. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk about the issues. We're going to talk. Issues. We're going to talk about ourselves. We're going to talk about. I got notes. We got tons of notes. Are we rolling now? We're rolling. We're rolling. I got notes. We got the Rocky theme song. And this is. We'll start here. We'll start here. I think so. So what. The thing about Rocky. Is. <laughs> Great segue. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is how we'll roll into it. The thing about Rocky is it's a story of the underdog. Yeah. It's a story of a guy who's just your average Joe who just gets picked out by Apollo Creed, the champ, and given an opportunity at the title. Yeah. And the and the my favorite part about Rocky is the whole time he knows he's not gonna win. Like there's not even a thing in his mind that says, I will win, I'll beat Apollo Creed. His only focus the whole time is to go twelve rounds with the champ. He doesn't want to get knocked down. Ah. He doesn't want to tap out. Yeah. He w- he understood from the get go that he had something to prove to himself that he wasn't. And this is a quote from Rocky: I- "I'm not just no bum from the streets. Yeah. That I can go and I can I can stay for the stay for the fight against the best, the world yeah. heavyweight." When I think of Rocky, I think of him fighting Mr. T and uh, Hulk Hogan. That was my first Rocky mm-hmm. movie. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm always fascinated by because when I find a movie that really hits me, I want to know how it got made. I want to know who wrote it. Well, the first one, yeah, the first one is like a classic, right? I mean, it's a it's a cinema gem, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. When he was trying to get that script developed, he was basically living out of his car, and he ran out of money, and he had to sell his dog. And he believed so much in the script that he he ended up selling his dog, and he he was offered a part. He was offered to do the movie. They wanted to buy the script from him. But they said they would do it with a di- different actor, and he turned it down. He said wow. he would not sell the script unless he got to play Rocky. Yeah. And so that, and then he ended up waiting about a year and a half until he finally got it made. They paid him for it. They yeah. hired him on to do it. He went back to the gas station where he sold the dog and hung around for a week until he found the guy that he sold it to. Yeah. And he bought his dog back. Yeah, I, I saw um, a documentary on Stallone doing um, the ex- ex- Expendables. Mm-hmm. And the first one, and I mean, this guy is like directing it, and he's in it, and he's—I don't know what—it's like sixty-eight or some. He's all tore up. He's got to get shoulder surgery. He knows he's got to get the shoulder surgery, but he just keeps committed to the film. And it's like you're like, wow, Sylvester Stallone is no joke. Like you see why he's where he's at. Like the commitment, the dedication, the like kind of like—he was Rocky. Yeah. That Rocky was him. It's perseverance. It's not giving up. It's not yeah. quitting. Yeah. It's having an idea and being willing to fight for it, whatever that is. Or just showing up. Half the battle, I think, is showing up. And now we have shown up. Here's the segue. And now we have shown up <laughs> in the most high show uh, lounge studio space. Uh, I'm going to introduce who we're with. We got James. James. And we've got Christian. Yep. And we've got me, Adam, Charles Abramowitz the first. Uh, yo, yo. And yeah, I, I was hoping we could just go around just to start with, just introduce ourselves and yeah. uh, introduce what brought us into this room. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll start then. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. All right, all right, I'm James. Um, always good to be here. Always good to be with you guys. Um, what brought me here? You know, I'm one of the one of the best things about being in recovery is is you get opportunities to uh, to share. Um your story of recovery and how your life has changed because, you know, I'm one of the lucky few who found, who found sobriety, who found this way of life. Um, and 
you know, the, the first couple of years, it wasn't really something, you know, the whole, the whole concept wasn't really something that I championed and was just like out there beating, beating the drums about, but I've yeah. got, you know, the last couple of years, <clears throat> so many good things, so many blessings have been brought into my life, you know, that, um, because, because of recovery and because of sobriety that, I, you know, I, I try to not miss out on a chance to, to let people know that, that this is something that you can have, yeah. you know, if, if, uh, if you, if you do the work, if, if, um, if you follow, follow those suggestions yeah. and, and just do the things that, that people before, you know, have done along the way. And that's, that's kind of, kind of where I am. I am today. It's really, it's really cool to be here. I'm really glad you guys are here today too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, just to go off that for a second, just, I think one of the things we can all relate to is the obsession and the craving to use drugs and alcohol. Yeah. That, that's something we've experienced well, before. Yeah. Years and years, of course. Years and years of, of needing something to feel okay. What for, what for you, James, was, uh, you talked about since you stopped, you know, what the work is. Could, could you kind of like describe what that has been like for you from the, how long, well, first off, how long have you been sober? This is my fifth year. Fifth year sobriety. In, in sobriety. Um, the, the work for me has been learning how to learning how to stay consistent with um, things like honesty mm. and um, things like open mindedness um, and just the, the continue the continued willingness to uh, keep this at the center of of my life to keep recovery at the center of my life. And it's, you know, and, and I use the word work now really loosely because I got to tell you the first couple of years, I mean, it, it was like, it was clawing up the hill. I mean, it was, it was work. I mean, it was mental work. It was certain, it was physical work it, and a lot of spiritual work, which up till that point was non-existent for me. That whole, that whole realm, spiritual realm was not even something that I'd even examined. Right. in my life. So that was all new and implementing that into my everyday life was something that I had, I had to learn. So, so it's, it's, it's much the same as like, say a college student would say they're, you know, they're working their butt off day and night, studying day and night. That's how it was the first couple of years. Really the last couple of years though, have been, um, I wouldn't say it's been easier but it has been, I've sort of built up some sort of muscle memory mm -hmm. as a result of a lot of the things that I've been doing. Because today I do the same things. I try to do the same things today to keep me sober that got me sober years ago. Yeah. And then and then try to continually layer that. And, th and that's what I wanted to pick apart. Um, what were those things in the very beginning? Because I know from my, from my experience... I mean, I was a heroin addict. I, I drank and used Adderall. I was always needing to be on something. Yeah. And when the day happened where my, I guess my bottom hit, where it was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to detox myself. My father asked me what I was going to do. And, you know, I'd understood what 12 step programs were. I'd been to rehab a couple times, but I never really understood what people talked about when they meant doing the work. Okay. And this is one of the things I kind of wanted to open up and talk about was because we, we throw around a lot of terms and we use ways to describe oh, what yeah, recovery right. is right. without actually like for me. Knowing, yeah, we're, yeah. yeah. For me, for me, it was like day seven sober, day six sober. I went to my first meeting and then the next day I couldn't be alone. I would wake up early in the morning. My body would be not able to sleep. You know, I just I had to be around people all day because I was afraid of using. I was afraid of getting messed up. I was afraid of what my thoughts were doing. And so I, for me, the work in the very beginning was like I, any, any time I had available, I was at a meeting, a 12 step meeting. And if I wasn't at a 12 step meeting, I was calling people who gave me their numbers. Yeah. And it was like that for a long time. Like, and it wasn't until I was over a year sober that I spent a day by myself and it was a challenge. That was work. That was the work for me that day, a little over a year sober saying today, I'm going to stay at my house this afternoon and see how I feel. Because I was so afraid to be yeah. alone. I just told somebody that they just got to do it because um, they were uh, on the four-step. 
and uh, when they, they said they call it the third, the three step shuffle. Oh yeah. You get to the, get to the fourth, you don't do it, you step back out. And so I told him, I said, look, you just got to do it because he's like wanting it to be like purist. And I'm like, this is work, you know. When you go to work, because you got to go to work, you know. And, and it makes sense what you were saying because really the key tenet that has not changed is honesty. Yeah. Yeah. And like you're saying, it's James. Center. Like if you're honest and you want to do the work, it's so simple. Get a sponsor and be honest with them. Yeah. And if the sponsor doesn't work, find another sponsor. Mm -hmm. Because I was always confused about the steps. They're always on the wall. There's 12 of them. Yet mm -hmm. they've constantly changed for me depending on where I'm at. It's like for me today, I'm powerless over my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Drug, drinking and drugging is no longer even in my purview. Even the thought just doesn't even come around anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's, I was thinking that on the way here, I was like, what am I powerless over today? And it was like, oh, I'm powerless over the thoughts that I'm having. And then I thought about the second step is like came to believe that a power could restore me to sanity. I was like, oh, how would that apply to me today? I can't fix the way I'm thinking. So I'm going to believe that something else that's not me, if I listen to someone else, if I engage in mm -hmm. an activity. And that's why I wanted to ask is kind of like, you know, we have the steps, we have the work, we have recovery as a whole, but what is it that we're doing? Because I'm, I'm almost six years sober. You're five years sober. You're working on seven, right? Uh, working on eight. Eight. Depends if I get there. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. I might go get high tonight. I don't know. <laughs> yes. I don't know. That's, that's With the most high show, you'll never need to get high. <laughs> hey, if you don't see me here next week, you're going to know. <laughs> There will be no it's just more Adam and James here. <laughs> yeah, we will take all your. Well, you'll probably sell us all your stuff. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Cheap. Cheap yeah, on the low. I don't need this stuff anymore. Yeah. Right. What well, was like you were saying, Adam? Like, okay, so day seven, you're honest about the fact that you're pretty sure you can't be left alone. You know, and and that just that little starting to come to grips with the honesty of your situation um, and, and telling people that because uh, I know, I know that for me early on a challenge for me was d trying to figure out what was really honest for me or what my alcoholism was telling me was honest. So, you could have easily said, you know, at that day seven, ah, oh, you know, I'm pretty good to be left alone. Or maybe I don't need to make that phone call that I've made up to this point. Um, but it's those little kind of, you know, to a lot of people that might seem elementary, those, those little specific things. Well, that's a great, that's a great point because I think that's like the grace is that the honesty is actual honesty and not like some like twisted thinking because like not everybody what's the you know there's there are those of us who just can't do rigorous honesty right and it's like i don't know why i like you said like you, you know kind of the grace to be here today it's like why was i able to be honest because i was not think the only thing i did right was i showed up and i was honest you know um but some people they just they lack it they just it, it just eludes them they don't know and they don't and they think they're being honest but they're really just feeding a, a, a lie or kind of like letting their ego take over or the addiction in it itself is kind of masquerading and they kind of just fall back into the whole the whole thing so like the honesty thing is like i mean that's why you need a sponsor that's why you need someone with you to call you out and to you know but if you're even not even playing that game right then you know that's the thing that's interesting to me is it's like what is it that makes some of us have that ability to be honest and some of us just we're not you know we just can't seem to get it well it's what we were talking about uh james earlier when when you mentioned when we mentioned vulnerability it's like we're all doing our best to be honest we're all saying what we know or what we think we know but there's a difference between being honest and being vulnerable there's a difference between being in a room full of people and reiterating what everyone's saying <laughs> Rather than saying, I don't know out loud in front of 30 people. Right. Or I'm scared in front yeah. of 30 people. And it's it takes courage. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'll be honest. I mean, I think that there was a significant portion of my first few years that I was just saying the things that were the right things to say, you know. And I thankfully, I haven't gone back out and used or drank. But there are a lot of character defects that are that I still battle here at this in this stage. And... 
again, going back to, I thought at the time I was being completely 100% honest. And sure, I am probably more transparent than most people in most situ- in some situations. But even then, I was still kind of had this, as in retrospect, right? Like during that time, I thought, hey, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. But in retrospect, I look back and I go, well, you know, I was just saying the things that I, that were the things to say, right? I was kind of like going, oh, well, I should say this. And now here at this stage, I'm going, I'm starting to address some shit that I should have addressed in year one or two, but they just kind of laid there under the surface, like hidden, you know? That's not, and I don't say that condemning in any way. I thank God that I'm still sober and I've made it to this point. And then now I have the opportunity to kind of, you know, continue to become whole the way I see it. Yeah. And that's what, that's, what's tough about staying sober is that there's always something, you know, if you can't escape yourself, it's, you have to confront yourself and it's tough. It's not easy. There's stuff that I know I need to look at and I'm, I'm so overlooking at shit that I'm like, I don't even want to start this next phase I have to go through. Right. Cause I just want some peace for a little bit. Mm. And uh, yeah, I don't, I, I was wondering what are some of those things that are coming up for you today? Well, I think a lot of it's like, like just deep seated, like past kind of, um, <clears throat> I think I, I mentioned like in seminary, I had to do this exercise where I had to write a letter to my parents um, and basically tell them my side of the story uh, unfiltered. And with the, with the understanding, I wouldn't send them this letter, but I had to read the letter to somebody. And so I'm just like, okay, fine. Yeah. I mean, my parents have great relationship <clears throat> right now. We're good. So I'm thinking, yeah, we've, I've forgiven them. I've moved on. I've done all this work through 12 steps multiple times. You know, my first three years, I went through every, all 12 steps each year. Um, so I'm thinking I'm good. So I kind of dictate the letter on my phone and then I got to sit with the, the mentor at seminary and I, and I begin to read him the letter and it's like, boo hoos. I'm like, full mm-hmm. on, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, whoa, where the hell was this? Mm-hmm. I mean, so I that's can... one thing right there. Something that I thought I, maybe I did deal with it, but it's like, you know, uh, you know, I hate to use the onion analogy or the <laughs> peeling back the layers or the parfait analogy, <laughs> like, uh, Shrek and donkey would say, but that's what it is. It's like, yeah, I dealt with this part, but it's like, Oh, now it's like to finally say, you know what? I used to wear my past as like an honor, like a badge of honor. I made it through my parents being drug addicts and, and I'm not going to spill all their business, but I made it through a terrible transition in my life. And I used to wear that as a, as a badge. But now was, this year was the first time I was able to say, no, that hurt. Like, and that made me scared that I'm going to create the same thing. So we create protections and, yeah. and ways of dealing. Right. Yeah. So that was huge, super healing. It, it made the result of that was, I think I was, um, uh, I was, it softened my heart and I was able to love my wife in a more authentic way from that one exercise. I mean, I guess it's good, right? I mean, she's, you never want to actually arrive, right? Cause then you're, as soon as you think you got it, that's probably the day, the day before <laughs> you're at the, the hour, derby the drinking a of, yeah. Irish car bomb. Have you had any similar experiences? Well, I've had several, as a matter of fact, what where you're, you're kind of, at the the best analogy I can use is you're sort of standing at the base of a mountain and looking up. And there's always a ton of fear when it comes to these things. Um, but I can tell you, um, and, I, and I think you just sort of testified to that, I can tell you that, that once I sort of walked through that, sort of what, what is typically a thin veil of fear, mm-hmm. I always feel 100% better. A hundred percent of the time I feel better when I walk through that and sort of do, do that, um, particular task that's going to get me further away from, you know, using than I was yesterday. Mm. And that's kind of what this is all about. This is all about for me is doing what I have to do, even though I, most of the time I'm very reluctant to, um, and scared to. But doing just doing what I have to do to get further away from that drink and 
because for me, when I, when I put that off and I sort of let that, that fear, um, take over to me in a lot of ways, that's, that's me practicing, um, lack of gratitude. Yeah. You know, one of the ways that I like to show my gratitude for being sober today, for having the life that I have today is just continuing to move forward, no matter how tough the situation might be, yeah. uh, no matter uh, how uncomfortable it is, um, just effing doing it because I now have enough of a track record to know that every time I'm going to come out a little stronger, a little better, yeah. with a little more knowledge that I can maybe hopefully pass along to somebody else, you know? Um, and I could get into certain specifics for me. It was specifically a lot of, um, financial things. Um, I was, I, and I still am very much an alcoholic financially. You know, I spend money, um, to make myself feel different, yeah, you know, and I, um, and that's something that just over the last several months, my sponsor and I have started to really look at and examine, and it's uncomfortable, and it's not, and it's not pleasant, but it, but it puts it out in front of me, and it shows it to me, and we talked about the seventh step the last time I was here, mm -hmm. and that's one of those character defects that this program allows me to put out in front of me and look at dead on. Yeah. you know, and walk, walk through no matter how uncomfortable it is, no matter how, um, unsavory it might be and just do it. And I always feel that better, but you know, that's, you know, in the years I've, I've been, I've been lucky enough to be, um, sober. There's been a hundred, hundreds of things like that. Hundreds of character defects that I've had to look at and examine and walk through. Are you able to recognize now when you're about to make a purchase, like where that's coming from and why you're doing it? Often, not, not all the time, mm -hmm. but often, which is, you know, which is a whole lot more than it used to be. Cause that's what I've you noticed know? that since I've been, it's been, a, we've all been sober for a while now. It's like they're micro behaviors, right? Oh. It's very subtle. Hundreds. Yeah. Yeah, the one thing that I happened to me yesterday was Saturday night I was feeling lonely. So I I called my uh my ex-girlfriend. And uh you know, we'd broken up a, few, a couple months ago, but we were still kind of, you know, we were just checking in with each other. So I called her cuz I, I was, and she didn't answer. And uh I was just like didn't think about it, just kind of went back, went to sleep eventually, and I woke up the next morning with like a page uh, text from her and she was like just saying like I hope everything's all right you know but I've met someone new and uh, out of respect for him I don't think we should talk anymore and uh, you know I think you're great and I love you a lot and I hope you can find someone that works for you but uh, this is kind of what we need to do this just happened this happened uh, so yesterday yeah and so so I read that when I woke up and I was just we talk about acceptance, right? Like instantly I was, just, I just accepted it. I was like, this is what it is. And I went out on the porch and I just felt really sad. And, and all these thoughts started coming in my head about what it meant to me. Like, why can't I move on? You know, I'm 31 years old. I don't have a family, you know, like what, what am I really doing? I don't they're even know what I, they're over <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what I want anymore. All the stuff I thought I wanted has come true. And now every day I feel like I'm fresh trying to make sense of who I am and what I'm supposed to do and all this stuff. And I'm just like sad. And my mind compartmentalized it. I just, I, what I wanted to do was delete the message. Actually, I didn't want to look at it when I went to my text messages, but I was like, I can't do that. Cause I've been running for, I always run from stuff in some sort of way. I always try to escape or pretend it's not there. And it wasn't until the end of the night, and this is what's relating what you were saying, Christian. The end of the night, I'm sitting next to my roommate, and I was like, I'm not going to run anymore. I was like, this is what happened to me. I talked about it. I said, this is what happened to me this morning. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read the text. And it was the act of reading it out loud, which really solidified it for me. And hearing and having someone else hear it is yeah. like, this is real. Right. You know? And, um, you know, it did. It, 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 
I don't know if it made it easier or not, but what it did do was, it, I guess it allowed me to, it's like the action of accepting. Yeah. The action of accepting for me is, is letting like whatever I have to accept, letting it be known out loud with another person. So it solidifies it. Yeah. Yeah. It's an action. One of the things on our whiteboard is it's an action based program, right? It's all about action. And in those actions is where the, on the other side of the action is where the freedom is, right? Like you passing through the veil, or me reading this letter. Yeah, my, my normal, this is all the work for me this last year has been is not using art to escape. My normal behavior yesterday morning was I went to the 12 o'clock triangle group. And on the way there, I'm writing poems the whole way, like raps and stuff, just trying to like express my feelings. But I, I will obsess over that. But I got to the meeting, I put the phone down. And the, you know, for me, the micro behavior, what you're talking about is like recognizing when I'm spending, like I, I recognized in real time that I was actually using my emotional state as a form of art. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. It was a using behavior for me. Yeah. And I was lucky I was on the way to the meeting. Cause once I got there, I was like, Oh, this is what I need to hear. Everyone else talk, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't even share in meetings because if I do, then I think about what I'm going to share the whole time <laughs> yeah. and then I don't hear anybody. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so full of myself. Like, geez. So I just say, I'm just not going to, sh I'm just going to listen because, uh, you know, uh, I've never left, you know, feeling worse. I always leave feeling better. You know? Always. I was scared shitless last night. I went to a like, young people heroin anonymous group. And a room full of like 30, 40 guys, and they're all talking about what we were talking about before, the work, recovery, spirituality, you know, all the, all the stuff we, we understand. And, and my, I got these butterflies in my stomach, and I was yeah. like, I'm, about to, I'm just about to keep it real. Yeah. And I told the story I just told. And this is, I get, and I'm relearning, I'm relearning this, because I've spent the last year and a half just making art instead of being o open and honest and vulnerable around people in real time. I'm like, I've been a lot anxious a lot recently because I'm having to relearn how to do this. Yeah. And this is how I think I could tell it was a good share was because I, I, I just told my truth and was vulnerable and was scared to say it out loud because there was girls in the room and I was just anxious about it. And my, my stomach was knotted up in anxious butterflies. And there was like this long period of silence of about three or four seconds. And I was just like, I'm Adam, I'm, I'm a heroin addict. And I just started. And at the end of it, I, like as I didn't, I lost myself in the share, and at the end of it, my I can tell something happened because my eyes are at the floor, and I'm unable to like look up for a few, sh a couple shares. It's like I'm, it's like a part of me has been just, yeah, sponged or like I'm, yeah. I feel naked, you know. That's like an actual share. That's like a real share. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you had the butterflies, and then you just did it, and then you're kind of like not sure exactly what you said. And then when you're done, you're feeling the effects of it. Yeah. And then afterwards, some guys come up to me and they're like, dude, thanks. Like, I I know what that feels, that loneliness. Yeah, right. You know? And then I meet, I have this chat with a dude outside and it's like, he's one of the coolest bros, knows all about Bruce Lee and Jeet Kune Do and stuff. And I end up going to the diner with all these people and it was like, man, it's like, the, I didn't feel lonely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's kind of what's amazing, like, you, when you started off about being in this recovery kind of community, it's like, you know, uh, it, it's, it's really like no other, I mean, you know, to be in this community because that somebody said that, you know, they, they had a friend who shared and, and he shared that he had just got out of prison after spending whatever, 10 years in prison. And he shares and he's super honest and everyone in the room kind of claps. And he, it's like he didn't, he didn't expect to be applauded, but they were applauding that here he is in a meeting after being in prison and, and he still wants to try and be better and get better. And so they were supporting him. And it was like he felt like if I was to go share that anywhere else, <coughs> everyone would just be kind of like not want to make eye contact, <laughs> yeah. you know. But this community seems to be on to something, you know, that's like uh, it's so beautiful. I mean, it's... Uh, because I think, I think to, I think to a certain degree, we all value that vulnerability yeah. that we, that we, at least for me, that I did not come to the table with. 
you know, and in fact, for the first couple of years, I would hear that word and I would just bristle. I mean, it's the last thing I wanted to partake in is any sort of vulnerability. And then it sort of dawned on me that probably kind of like acceptance and gratitude, uh, the more resistant I am to these notions, probably a good indication that these are the things that I need to probably yeah. embrace and yeah. bring into my recovery. Yeah. So once I started to really look at vulnerability coupled with honesty was when my, my recovery really turned a corner you know, because that, first of all, it made me more relatable to people that need, you know, people needed to hear that. You know, people coming in need to hear somebody who is keeping it real about the situations that are going on in their life and not worrying about how they're going to look, how they're going to sound, what it's going to come off like, just throwing it out there, just sort of dropping the mic in the room, as it were. And... In the, in the few instances I've been able to sort of open up, not just to my sponsor, but to my friends in recovery and to the group, ha is when I, you start to feel those effects, those real um, effects of recovery. And when you really start to understand what this whole honesty thing is all about. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have those opportunities to connect with people one-on-one -on -one because odds are there's somebody in the room especially if it's a well-populated room there's going to be somebody that's going to relate to something you say because yeah. i can tell you yeah. that made a huge difference for me early on when mm -hmm. i didn't have any concept of of you know i was too scared to speak because i would get trapped in my own head about what i was going to say how it was going to sound how it was going to come off i was going to god forbid i sound like the crazy person that i am you know <laughs> and but I needed those people who had a grasp of what vulnerability was yeah. to express that. Because I needed to see that is what I want in my life. Like, that is what I want to embrace. Interesting. That's interesting you said, because when we were eating, I, I told him that it's been, I've been in, this week I've been to like four or five different church meeting functions. But I haven't been to a 12-step meeting in, you know, a little over, over a week or over 10 days. And that's the reason that's the reason why I'm missing it is that level of vulnerability, even though I've been in these, you know, um, situations that were all pretty amazing. I mean, I think I have a pretty great community of believers that I'm a part of. But the level of vulnerability is nowhere near what I what I'm going to get when I go into step into a 12 step meeting. It's just it's a whole new level, you know, and Absolutely. I think that's what. That's what I'm missing is that, to hear that level of vulnerability to go, ah, yes, right, I'm not alone. Thank you. All those thoughts that I've been having, I'm not alone. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. I, you know, I don't want to get on this little box here, but, like, I really, being a Christian, it's so disappointing because when I read about my faith and I read about our, you know, teacher, our Lord, it's like, like, we should be the most conducive to this kind of life. You know, um, Christians should be the most conducive and the most, like, welcoming, you know, as, as it is in the 12-step meeting. I mean, there's no one who comes in there who's ever going to be like, you know, you'd have to really be causing some dysfunction. Yeah, you wouldn't. Out. <laughs> we, the only 12, this 12 step, you, we don't turn people away. Yeah, the only desire is a desire. To, that's the only requirement is a desire to so stop. Right? What do you think that is then about about Christian? Your, 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 what you just said. What do you think that is about the Christian oh, man, community? I think it's a deep, it's a deep, deep thing. I mean, I think there's a lot of, you know, it comes. I think it comes from a lot of stuff. Because we stuff. we know we know like I've only I only know as much as I know about how I perceive Jesus to have been. Based yeah. on the text that I've read and, and my understanding of of the Messiah, so to say. Right. And it, it seems to me he was one of those dudes that was just everybody. Love everybody. Love thy neighbor. Lo you know, don't yeah. turn people away. Yeah. Like, don't. Why do you feel like it's different? Why do you think it get, where does the where does it get muddied? Well, I mean, I'll give you kind of a 30,000 foot view. Um so I don't lose my ordination, um, which is, 
<laughs> wait, wait, we'll lose your ordination? <laughs> your ordainment? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, if I... No, I, no, I think it's basically it's this. The message of Jesus is, is love, right? Yes. Love your neighbor like you want to be loved. Love how I loved you. That is very wide. Be empathetic and that understanding of people's... Like anyone can define... Well, what's that mean? What's that mean to love? And there's all these questions and people can define it any which way. So what we did is we said, okay, well, let's put some boundaries. Let's put some rules in place because this whole love people thing is just a little too radical. A little it's too a little broad. A little there. too broad. It's a little too broad. We need some things in place because we need to know. And boundaries are not bad. I'm the benefit of having... My first years of a Christian was super strict. I had a very boundary beginning in my faith, and it, was, it resulted in where I am now to be able to kind of grow beyond that. But I think that's ultimately, from a 30,000th of you, that's what happened. And so with these boundaries, and what ends up happening is it's like we forget why did we put these boundaries there? Why was that boundary put there? And, and to realize that there really is no boundary. It's just like a, it's a, it's a metaphorical guardrail, but... What we've done is we've... When you say we, you, you mean... The Christian faith. We as Christians. I say we as me and the Christians. That's what Christians did. And so that's when you run into all this kind of... And it's all uh, uh, the different faiths or the denominations are just interpretations of what his... Jesus' teachings were, yeah? Well, I mean, when you're talking about de denominations, I think you're talking about something different because I think you're talking about one of the great things about Christianity, which is that, you know, you can have a body of people get together and go, well, we want to do it this way. And, and, and Jesus is like, cool, do it that way. And then a bunch of people get together over here, and go, well, we want kind of want to do it this way. Cool, do it that way. Because for Jesus, guess, guess what? It's all about love. So, you know what I mean? His, his thing is very broad. So, yeah, y'all want to go over in there. You don't want to have a band, and you want to have strobe lights and smoke machines, and you want to, like, do that? Cool. You want to be back here with robes and uh, the biggest... What, what, <laughs> James, what's your take on, on, on your faith or your religious per views? Do you have a... How do you affiliate yourself spiritually? Well, I, Well, I can tell you right now, the way I look at it is spirituality and religion for me are kind of two separate, mm -hmm. two separate things. And, um, you know, I came in with, you know, and I've heard this said a lot and it sort of applies to me also, you know, once my mind sort of cleared up enough to start comprehending the 12 steps that I saw on the wall, you know, for, I, I would see God throughout those steps. And, you know, I, I miss, I made the mistake of applying the sort of God of my childhood and my adolescence yeah. to that, um, which I had spent a lot of years running from and trying to toss off. Um, and one of the things that I've, I've come back to is what he was, what Christian was saying is that the basic tenet of Christianity and the basic tenet of a lot of these spiritual movements is love. God is love. I've heard that since I was a child, since I could comprehend anything. God is love. And so I've tried to resist throwing out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to Christianity or organized religion. Um, and not to say that I'm necessarily like cherry picking things that are good for me, but, but sort of grasping those basic ideas of Christianity, specifically, God is love, love thy neighbor, love each other as you, as you want to be loved, you know? Um, and that's kind of, kind of where my stance is right now with it, is trying to stay in trying to keep love at the center of this whole thing for me. Where can I give love? Where can I bring love into my life? Um, surround myself with love. Um, and that, that's kind of where it is for me. And that's, that's where I find a lot of growth spiritually. Um, and then not getting, not getting it um, confused with religion. 
because for me it just those two have to sort of stay separate you know what's a good what's a good explanation would be um practice uh what is it uh you don't per- place personality over the principles right principles before personality yeah principles before personality right and i think that in some ways that's christianity has invers- inverted that they've lost the principle in the personality of what it means to be a christian so they lost the principle of christianity yeah, part of that could have to do with the belief that if you don't believe, you're going to hell. Right. So they took an action-based program and made it a belief-based system. Does that make sense? Because Jesus was all about action, right? He's walking around doing a bunch of stuff, right? And the quickest way, I mean, to think that believing in something is an action, like right. you could feel that way, but it's actually not. Right. And so a lot of we all have goes back to like Greek thought and Greek influence and Greek philosophy, philosophy influence over how scriptures. Yeah, it's people it thinking that it all goes down all the way. There's a hundreds of thousands of millennials right now who think that if they just believe that what they want will attract, it'll attract itself to them. If you just believe in law of attraction. And that's just the reality is you have to like literally do something. <laughs> you can't be sitting around like. And that's the thing too is like I I could relate to what you were saying because uh, uh, James because when I when I wake up in the morning man like all I want to do is be a conduit for love or a universal will I just whatever wants to flow through me because mm. I know after that morning time I'm kind of back in my own world there's unless I take an effort to to recognize and alleviate myself from myself and and uh, and be like I I really clear my mind I really don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I want to be of most use to whatever wants to be. It's like, I get, it's like our natural solipsism, which is just the idea that I think all of us running around, like we're the center of our universes, essentially. Yeah. Right. Like everything is always happening around me all the time. I'm always with me. There is no, like now never ends because now is always happening and I'm always here. Yeah. And so it's like, I have to do work to recognize that nothing is about me. It's not like if I can, because I know when we leave here, y'all will not be thinking about me unless you do. Then I feel lucky. But like chances are there's a hundreds of people I know that are not thinking about me <laughs> and we're going to bounce into each other and keep doing what we want to do in our lives. It's right. happening to all of us. Yeah. So for me, it's like and this is the weird thing is like I used to run around with the thought that we all like the universe, you know, according to relativity, theory of relativity with Einstein basically says that time has happened and experienced Time is experienced individually. Your time is different than my time, which is different than James' time. So what I had to work myself to realize is like separate from all that nonsense and just go with this. Is like the world isn't revolving around me. The world is happening with me. And if I can just understand that I'm part of this thing as it's expressing itself, it's not about me. It's not not about me. Yeah. It just is what it is. Yeah. I have a, so I like to equate like self and soul. There's a me that shows up in a unique way, like a special snowflake. We all have special snowflakes, mm-hmm. but it takes, it takes work to understand like that, even that special part, the part that's talking or writing the music or having ideas and making the, de- really, I'm just the dude that makes the decision to start writing the idea down. Yeah. The idea came from the ether of, yeah. of universal You're creativity in something greater and bigger than you. Yeah, yeah. So, but the, the part I get, you know, caught up in and especially in recovery and work in a program is like recognizing and trying to work away myself to the point of the extreme of like, you yeah. can, everything can be taken to extremes. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that certainly is true for, um, a lot, a lot of the organized religion. And so, um, because I, I experienced a lot of that when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And so I, I equated Christianity with the, ex, the, the sort of the extremism that I had experienced yeah. when I was young. And so, you know, my first inclination as I got older and was able to separate myself was just to toss the, all of it off, just yeah, get right. rid of it all. Right. I have, I don't want anything to do with any of it. It's all BS. But this program and my sobriety has allowed me to c- circle back and look at the things in Christianity, the things in, in these different religions that are 
very useful, um, not just to me, but to, to, to people around me. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that helped me every single day. And again, I come back to that whole notion of love. Like, where can I implement love? Like, right here, right now, today, with whatever I'm doing. Yeah. You know, and also keeping in mind that, you know, I am a, I'm, I think there might be a song about this, but I am literally dust. Yeah. You know, I'm dust in the wind, <laughs> you know, and yeah. um, I am not, I'm not that big of a deal, whether <laughs> as much as I want to be, I really am not. Yeah. So where in my, my little corner of my little world, can I just be as loving as I can with yeah. whatever, with whatever is going on? Which just to tie it back into the very beginning of the conversation of what it's like, what it means to do the work and to get sober and to recover it, an addendum to what you're saying. It is your responsibility. Yeah. Like no one's going to share in the meeting for me when I'm scared. Right. So like, yes, everything's happening and like, it's, it's not all about me, but like I, after being in the field for so long and losing so many people and seeing what's been happening out here is like, I can't, I know I can't save anyone, but I do know the actions I've taken up to this point have allowed me to save myself. Mm. Yeah. And it's like, for me, the perfect group or the perfect meeting is a room full of people that are literally sharing to save themselves. They're not trying to convince me of anything. They're not trying to tell me how to work the program. They're not describing how great their life is. Mm -hmm. They're in there showing up daily to just, you know, and save yourself could be termed in different, like I know like I'm my own worst enemy. So a lot of times I just need to get myself out. So it's not battering me in the head. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, you're, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking of uh, the, the Buddhist concept of that most people walk around in a subconscious state of mind and that most people aren't conscious, you know, throughout the throughout a day. And and that's kind of what that meeting is. That meeting is like you get into the meeting and it like brings you out of your subconscious, hopefully into a conscious state of mind. And you're like, whoa, I'm actually here. I'm listening and I'm actually experiencing this. It's happening instead of kind of operating based on my instincts or what I'm supposed to do or what I think I'm supposed to do or what I think you think I should be doing. It's about what am I doing right now in this moment? And that's, I think, the beauty of when you're in those, those meetings and you hear someone share a thought that's not contrived, you're like, oh, okay, now I remember why I'm, I'm here. That's reason. Usually it's the person who's like a couple days in that says something and it's like, oh, yes, exactly. That's it. You know, it's like you're talking to all these people who got all these years in there and it's like the person who's got two, three days, they seem to have the sometimes the most yep, profound thing to say. That's half the reason why I show up yeah. is to experience those moments and get those reminders of, you know, how... <laughs> how real this thing is, you know, and how, um, you know, how, how desperate I used to be, you know, and I get to hear those, those, uh, not just, you know, those philosophical shares where people, you know, have learned so much and are, you know, wanting to share that with everybody in the room, but also, you know, the people who, who are just trying to put one hour in front of the next. Yeah. You know, and just make it through that day, and because I need to remember how it was, because that's how it was for me at the beginning. Mm. You know, man, we're so lucky that we get to do that. Yeah. You know, we're so lucky that we live in a city that has the tremendous amount of recovery that Atlanta has. Yeah. Because you know, almost at any hour of the day, we can get our butts in the car and drive into a room and hear, hear, hear that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um. Man, it it really it really makes me very grateful. Yeah. You know. What? How long are we? Where are we at? Yeah. Fifty. We'll nice. Let's wrap it up. About to die. Yeah. 
So if anyone's still listening at this point, yeah, <laughs> scared everybody off. <laughs> you get then you get a free Jimmy John. Free Jimmy <laughs> John. Just message us and say you heard it this far. We recommend the tuna. Yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> and we'll send you a free Jimmy John if you get this far. Just text the word Jimmy John's to Christian Jansen's phone number, which I will be reading right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, limited supply. So, so how, yeah, how do how do we feel? How do we feel? What's uh, what's what's uh, do we want to have like just? How do we want to end it? I mean, I think we're we're doing it. So I thought it was great. It's good. I'm, thank you for taking the helm. Oh sure. And uh, I'll yeah. be your Kirk. <laughs> you can be my Spock. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, you can um, always. Check us out, themosthighshow.com. We always are needing um, continued monthly support, so we have some options to give $10 a month, $25 a month. Um, you know, we're, it's a very skeleton crew operation, but it allows us to kind of do things, to plan, to think about doing something, um, to buy some equipment or... To have more whatever. shows, more content. Have, yeah. More yeah. events. Yep. So if you want to be involved... Email, what, what uh, address? Yeah, you can email contact at themosthighshow.com. At themosthighshow.com. Please let us know you're listening, too. Just drop a line, say hello. Just, you know, I listen. Let us know because we, we have no idea who's listening yeah. and where y'all are from. And if you have any questions, too, or any topics you'd like us to talk about, yeah. shoot them our way. Yeah, exactly. All of that. At, what is it, themosthighshow.com. Yeah. Dot com. Wait, wait, is it, is it, e, wait, what is it, Christian Jansen at the most high? No, you just contact at the Contact. Most like contact high? Ah. <laughs> well, besides contact the website, guy. where else do you have content? YouTube. You have Facebook. Facebook, Instagram. If, you're, if you've made it this far and you're on the app, then there's a button that just message us right there. Like, mm. Go ahead and what you're going to need to do here is stop cleaning those tire molds. I'm talking to future me because tomorrow I'll be cleaning. Stop cleaning those tire molds. Send contact at themosthighshow.com your thoughts on yourself. How did you do in this podcast today, Adam? How do you think you could have done better? What was something you would have liked us to talk about? Time travel. <laughs> yes. So I figured out time travel, by the way. That's it. I you did. did it. The only way time travel is possible is if we live in a multiverse. Which we do. So some say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. So, yeah, thanks for wow, tuning in. Wow, lasted an hour? I know it's got bored. So much better with a bunch of more people wanting to. Whoa! Oh. I'm glad it happened just then. Right. Let's do it again. This time we'll record. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good rehearsal, guys. Yeah, good rehearsal. I really, I approve that. <laughs> <laughs>